Native Vote 18. Hi, I'm Mark Trahant, and I am a member of the Shoshone Bannock Tribes for all Idaho, and I also run a blog, Trahant Reports. I uh, plan to talk today about elections, and I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I really regret that. Uh, but I think there's an interesting message, so I'm happy to do it this way. A couple things you ought to know before I get started. First, this cycle, Indian country has both the quality and the quantity of candidates that I think is extraordinary. Uh, Native Vote 18 is how I'm labeling uh, the candidates. They continue to grow in depth, uh, having backgrounds preparing them for public office, as well as uh, being able to raise the key amounts of money. And uh, this should surface in offices ranging from state governors to uh, Congress. Second, um, my goal in all of this is to make sure that people have enough information in Indian country where they want to vote, where they want to turn out and make a difference. And I think that works part um, hand in hand with the work that many of you do in terms of voter education and voter drives and uh, getting people interested in the process. So I thank you for that. So much of the work uh, really started with NCAI uh, after termination when there was a great de desire to kind of make sure that it never happened again. And uh, Helen Peterson was writing in the American uh, Political Journal um, in the late 1950s about NCAI's effort to try and get people registered to vote and turning out to vote. And this is an article she wrote. One of the things in that article really struck me, and that is in 1952, nine of the 19 Pueblos in New Mexico had no registered voters. And uh, there was a push, uh, by 1956, a voter education program, and uh, three achieved 100% registration. And as I mentioned, to me, one of the goals ought to be to figure out ways to outvote our representation so that if 100% uh, registered everywhere and turned out and the surrounding community only registered at 50% or 70%, that would give us an advantage in terms of uh, long-term having a say in uh, the discourse. So this cycle, there are 15 candidates running across the country for either Congress or statewide office. And uh, I'm pretty um, open about how I identify candidates. So people say they're indigenous or they identify with a tribe, uh, whether or not they're a tribal member, I include them in my count. Um, certainly you're free to uh, narrow that or widen it as the case may be. I don't include supporters, for example. And in many of the databases, they do uh, do chronicle people who support tribal affairs. I use a Google Fusion tablet, which is really easy to manipulate. In fact, um, the nice thing about Google Fusion is you can do three things. One, it creates a spreadsheet, and second, it creates cards, and third, it creates a map so you can find out where uh, people are running across the country. Of course, let's start with the elected office holder. I think um, this one is going to be particularly interesting. It's uh, Lieutenant Governor Byron Malott in Alaska. He has already announced he's running for re-election with uh, Governor Bill Walker. They ran as a team uh, last time around. Uh, there's going to be tremendous pressure on this race in particular for the Democrats to nominate or not nominate a candidate. So uh, just to refresh your memory, um, four years ago when they ran, um, Byron Malott was the Democratic nominee, and Bill Walker was a um, independent. And uh, and I moderated a couple of debates. It was interesting because as they were going around the state, you could really see how they were um, in sympathy on so many issues across the board. And those conversations continued to the point where um, Lieutenant Governor Malott decided to uh, drop off the race as uh, the governor nominee from the Democrats and run on the independent ticket as a lieutenant governor. Um, this time around, there's a lot of pressure for Democrats to nominate their own candidate. And uh, should they do that, it changes the equation uh, considerably. Uh, the way it worked last time is uh, Governor Walker and Lieutenant Governor Malat ran as a team and an independent, and they still won uh, by less than two percentage points. So you can see how, um, how much challenge there will be to try and uh, keep a Democrat off the ballot. The Democrats are already uh, saying, uh, some are saying anyway, that uh, Byron Malott ought to withdraw from the ticket and run as a Democrat. Uh, if he does that, um, then probably will guarantee the Republican nominee, whoever that is, uh, picking up that seat. 
Let's go to Idaho, where uh, Paulette Jordan is running as a Democrat for governor of Idaho. Idaho is such an interesting state because it has a long history of uh, Native uh, involvement. Uh, back in 1964, when he was National Congress of American Indians president, uh, Joe Gary first ran and won a seat in the Idaho legislature and then won a seat in the Idaho State Senate, and then eventually ran for the Democratic nomination for the United States Senate from Idaho. He, he was unsuccessful, but uh, his presence in Idaho continues to resonate. And I think Paulette Jordan kind of picks up on that. She's been crossing the state so far with uh, not a lot of money. But what's interesting is the other Democrat running against her, uh, they filed their campaign finance reports. And in my database, I actually linked to the reports. Uh, he didn't have a lot of money either. He's lent himself um, $175,000, but he hasn't raised much more than Paulette Jordan. So I think that will be significant um, to see what kind of money she raises. Speaking of money, the all-time champion is Tom Cole, Chickasaw from Oklahoma. Uh, he has about $1.7 million and a considerable sum in cash in the bank. Uh, there's an outside shot that should Cole win re-election and the Republicans continue to control the House, that he could end up being appropriations chairman. Uh, a lot depends on what happens with other House races, but he's certainly in the mix uh, for that possibility. Moving uh, to another state office in Minnesota, um, very early on, U.S. Representative Tim Waltz decided to run for governor and uh, decided from kind of just straight out of the get-go to uh, bring in Peggy Flanagan as his running mate, as lieutenant governor. This is really rare to have a candidate this early saying, this is who my um, lieutenant governor would be. And they're very much running as a team, traveling the state together and getting people um, engaged in ways that's uh, pretty rare in politics. What really works here is they're able to play off each other's strength. Um, they've already um, amassed a great deal of money. Way, uh, in fact, all of the Democrats in Minnesota are doing extraordinarily well. And Waltz Flanagan have more than a two to one advantage in terms of the actual um, money race in Minnesota. They also recently won the state caucus preference vote uh, they had about a third of the vote, and the next closest competitor was 20%. So they look very strong going into the um, primary season. Uh, Minnesota has an unusual process where the state convention has a lot of say. And in this caucuses that were just held last week, they elected delegates. And so those delegates will be critical toward uh, figuring out uh, whether or not they can move forward without a primary. This race is historical. Uh, this is the first time that I know of anyway that two uh, tribal members have run against each other for the U.S. House of Representatives. So this district will be a native district likely, uh, unless somebody wins a primary that we're not expecting. Uh, Representative Mark Wayne Mullen is in the office now representing the U.S. House in the 2nd District of Oklahoma. And um, Jason Nichols, the mayor of Tahlequah, is running against him. Uh, so far in the money race, Mark Wayne Mullen has uh, tremendous amounts of money, not as much as... Um, either Tom Cole or Dino Rossi, but he has a great deal of money. Uh, Jason Nichols so far has been running a ragtag campaign. Speaking of money, um, and I want to mention these cards because I haven't got them quite done yet, but by the time the primary season uh, gets underway, I want to have uh, little cards for every candidate. And this cycle, I'm actually thinking about printing them up and uh, distributing them so people will have these uh, cards to show what kind of candidates are going. Um, since um, 1789, the United States Congress has elected about, um, I was just looking for the exact number, eleven thousand people, I'm sorry, 14,000 people to the House and Senate, and there's never been a Native American woman. And um, Deborah Holland is the latest to try. In my uh, research, I found 11 candidates who've done it before her. Um, several have come close, um, but none have kind of got over that uh, final hurdle. And uh, Deborah Holland's in a situation where this is what uh, is a plus seven Democratic district, so that if she can win the primary, she has a really good shot at carrying the seat in November. So the real key race for her is between now and, and June 5th when uh, people will vote in the primary. 
Montana or uh, New Mexico also has the distinction of having two congressional candidates. Gavin Clarkson, Clarkson is running on the Republican side in a district just south of um, Albuquerque. Deborah Holland would be representing Albuquerque. In state legislatures so far, I've identified 56 candidates across the country running for different state house offices, um, a wide variety of candidates. Um, we already have uh, two states, Minnesota and um, Montana, that have enough of a, and Alaska that have enough of a, a presence to have significant caucuses. Arizona, New Mexico would also be in that category. And uh, this uh, race, this election, I think you could actually see that increase in many places. For example, in Minnesota, you're getting two new candidates um, added that could add to the mix. Uh, one other thing about Minnesota is that it's mostly women. And um, when you think, when I started to chart that across the board, in fact, um, there's actually uh, four Native women in the Minnesota legislature, so it's a Native Women's Caucus. And... Um, it turns out that if you look across the country, there are 7,383 seats in 50 states of Native Americans, uh, which is about 1% of legislatures. So uh, Congress, I mentioned, is 0.37%, one-third of 1%. So legislatures were actually doing better than Congress by threefold. And in those legislatures, um, at least 25 of those seats are held by uh, Native women. And another way to look at the data, there are 1,800 legislative seats held by women, and that works out to a representation of about 1.4%. So it's higher than parity. Um, if you look across the board for all elected officials, women uh, are only about 25%, but for uh, Native women, it's about 40%. And uh, I think this is significant, and it shows that uh, there's more opportunity here for women. And this cycle, what's really interesting is you're seeing more and more particularly younger women um, running for office. So that's what I have today. And I'm um, happy to answer questions. Trey Hant reports on Twitter. And uh, if I miss candidates, which I often do because there are just so many out there, please feel free to drop me a note and I'll get them on my database and start following them. Thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing from you.